and welcome to Gaming Mechanics, a podcast that seeks to explore the unexplored topics of games, how they work, why they work, and why we love them. I am your host, Mark, and with me today is the... Oh, who Greg... am I? What? Who am I? The... Well, you're, the... you're Greg. Remember, you're signed oh, in as Greg. yourself. Oh, oh, yeah. You're really All ruining right. this, Greg. This, this really little bit that we do. Yeah, God, that was, that's the reason most people listen. This is this is what happens when you sacrifice anonymity. Write your senators. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the world's a violent place, and uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk about before we jump into the show is uh, we've never asked for money on this show, and you know we've we've cranked out a number of episodes here. But Greg was talking last time about getting a PS4. And uh, I thought it'd be really fun to set up a Patreon to help him to do that. So uh, if if you want to hop on there and donate a couple bucks, it is just patreon.com slash gaming mechanics. Um, you should be able to find us on there pretty easily. And uh, for every dollar that the viewers donate, I also will donate a dollar to get Greg a PS4 uh, up to 150 bucks because PlayStation 4s are only $300 now. If you didn't know that, and that sounds really cheap to you. Go out and get a PlayStation 4. Um, I wish I had one as well. But soon I will live near Greg and we can share it. So. <laughs> that was, yeah. That, I I am not accustomed to asking for things or money at all. And uh, Mark pitched this to me right before we went on. And uh, that would be, I would be overwhelmed. It would be fantastic. I would love that. But also, I mean, for what it's worth, it would, it would yeah, I mean... Just imagine how much we'd have to talk about if we actually like played games. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah, new games. Yeah. We would actually have new material. It would be amazing. It'd be fantastic. About that, like, when he was like, "Like I love the God of War thing." It's also remarkable that you guys can do an entire thoughtful hour worth of content on a game that neither of you have played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's so fair. imagine the follow-ups we could do. It'd be remarkable. Oh, it would be anyway, so many follow-ups. Uh, to, to do that, but um, but that would be awesome. I would love that. That would and that would be that would directly benefit the show. So it would absolutely. And you know, I I'm always a fan of having people give towards something in specific and not just you know generally help me buy food because thankfully I'm not right. at that I'm not at that level where like I need food. I'm I'm good with food. Um, yeah, Mark's <laughs> fast food. He's he's. Yes, and Maslow's hierarchy. We've we've uh, we've gone past that, but uh, hierarchy is bullcrap, actually. Yeah, but it does include food. Uh, okay. Well. Okay. <laughs> yes. Today we're going to cover the topic of violence. Now we've already covered this topic, but this is going to be a completely different look at this topic. Um, last time we talked about violence, and uh, we talked about the effects that it had on gamers. And this time we're really talking about the effects it has on games. Um, if that sounds really strange and esoteric, stay with us, and we will uh, put some some more description on that. But uh, yeah, exactly, like I, I think it goes without saying that there's just a lot of violent metaphors and systems in games. Uh, Greg, you want to talk a little about that? Totally. Yeah. No. I mean, it just kind of came out of the, the thought process for this episode was what does a truly non-violent game look like slash what do nonviolent games or or what does that even mean and why is that such a a novel idea um so i guess thinking about violence and its place in games and and why it is the way it is um i guess we'll start by talking briefly about just some of the genesis um from a a couple different viewpoints i mean functionally um and mechanically in games um it's interesting if you think about the the very very games uh they they weren't that violent actually in, in some ways particularly old old arcade games some of the most popular ones if you think about i mean all the way back to pong obviously but then you have uh pac-man and um like snake um you have say like i mean galaga um has violence in it but in large part we don't see kind of the, the violence dominated uh world of games that we see now anyway or is is a lot more obvious at least today right um the the thing that i think is is interesting is mechanically just in in terms of especially as technology kept on moving i think in large part the early lack of violence was due to lack of technology to be able to simulate it well um 
But uh, but past that, once that began happening, games kind of moved more towards that. I think a big part of that is uh, just the genesis of of the, the culture of the people who were making games and and the things they were into and uh, the type of people they were. Um, gaming was actually a very countercultural movement at the beginning. It was it was poorly understood and it was tended to be uh, uh, far closer to the outcast range of certainly people who were playing and uh, and certainly making games. Um, and, and it's uh, it's weird how counter like one of, this is one of the things about countercultures is the counterculture becomes sort of a, a large culture in and of itself. And so right. although there are typically usually multiple countercultures, they are all likely to associate with one another. And so yeah. if you've got um, if you've got yeah. like the nerdy gamer counterculture and you've also got like the punk counterculture, those yep. people are actually more likely to interact with with each other than they are with the mainstream. Yep, absolutely. No, that's a great point. I like that a lot. And I think there's a lot of crossover there, particularly in terms of, you know, it was the early 80s, um, and just culturally you had, it's, it's a time of prosperity, you know. Uh, there's no huge wars in America. We have a, a large amount of uh, wealth coming into the, you know, counterculture really becomes a, a huge thing in a, in a different way than, like, the Vietnam protests, say, in, like, the 60s, 70s. Right. Uh, now counterculture is more about like rebelling against this really safe idea of, of prosperity and, and, and normalization and all that jazz. And uh, so I think a big part of that would be um, being able to, to lean into, I think that may be part of why uh, the violence in video games um, became more of a staple, um, particularly with uh, when it became a little bit more popular past the arcade stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly, of, you know, like these uh you know we talked about arcades as a social place too you know whatever the new game is that comes in that has to draw a crowd um mm-hmm. with, with you know in age before the internet where only the mouth is there and, and how, how do you do that well shock value is a pretty easy way um, yeah but even past, um that's kind of the social side of it more mechanically too just thinking like a lot of games and again t- talking about the type of people again without you know we're, we're generalizing here but as a proud nerd and, and gamer myself i feel semi-confident to speak about my forefathers um the idea of you know a lot of them probably would have been pretty much and pretty pretty hard into fantasy or sci-fi um that's where a lot of those those that's a kind of two of the huge huge overarching trends in, in video games even today um and uh in in large part those those stories the fantasy narrative the the science fiction narrative um are adventure driven they are conflict driven that's just the way that works um, in story, and, and the easiest way to replicate um, conflict into a, a vis- both a visual medium and an interactive medium is to physically embody it, right? Through right. Having to punch things or destroy things or remove obstacles physically, right? Um, that's, that's honestly the really low-hanging fruit in a way to move a story forward when you have to actually be interacting with the story, especially when you're in a point where you actually can't, you don't have the technology available to, you know, give a, intensive social interactions or other problem-solving right. in the way that you, you know, today with, like, you know, uh, or, you know, Divinity Original Sin. Like, you can't, they couldn't have done that back in the late 80s, early 90s. So yeah. I think just that those two places... Um, like uh, and and outside of that too, just like yeah, I mean, there's a reason action movies are are is, it can be true in a lot of media, but there's a reason that action is is exciting. Um, people like it; it's cool, it's fun. Um, I do think as well as it's as, non. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say I do think at, when when you were talking about narratives, like as narrative has worked its way more into gaming, um, I I think that violence has continued and maybe even increased as a. Uh, something that is in video games, um, just a, a way of creating tension, a way of creating conflict, um, and so early on, like there, there's not really a story to Galaga or to even Mortal Kombat is a very thin story. The early ones, um, and so uh, as as the games have become more narratively focused and more elaborate in their narratives. Um, I think violence has it's it's been kind of surprising that it's continued to play such an important part because you would think mm-hmm. that like well there's lots of dialogue and character development and stories that's what makes a good story right it's like you feel invested in the character but right. I think a lot of that for some reason 
um, it, it's still video games depend a lot on violence. And, and that's one of the things I want to really unpack and talk about today is like, why has violence sort of made itself such a staple in video games, even after it seems like we, we could tell compelling what stories without violence? Yep. Like, yeah, there are plenty of novels that don't really have much violence in them. Um, yep. A, lot, a decent number of movies too, and and so I, I that had no violence. What was it called? Well, okay, there was a little bit of okay. it, it was super super minimal. Uh, it's called Woman. Uh, Sorry, you cut, you, you cut out. out there. What is it called? Uh, Woman in the Window. Woman in the Window. Okay, really good. I highly recommend it. It's a it's thriller. It reads really quick, um, but anyway, we're not talking about thrillers today. We should do a separate club. Um, in any case, that, that book had a single scene of violence across 479 pages and uh, was riveting, right? So, yes, narrative does not require violence. That is, that is not true. Um, but here we are in video games. I do think that the effect of it, the visual medium really matters. Because, um, again, talking about like the interactivity in a visual space, how do you, how do you conceptualize that? Um, usually by physically you know, like doing moving something physically interacting with it um changing something right mm -hmm. and, and right, then just combine that with okay then by default we need conflict um so you have something to interact with that you don't want there then how do you remove that like with by force with violence like it's just a kind of a, a straight very straightforward train of decisions absolutely um, that, that comes out of that in a visual interactive conflict driven <laughs> piece of media like i don't know um, yeah, we'll it's like I mean you can't yeah. you can't see diplomacy, right? Like right, exactly. you can you can have diplomacy, you can talk about it, but it's really not it doesn't lend itself well to being on a screen. Right. There aren't too many political thriller video games, you know? <laughs> like not, you know. Or like or like or like uh who's the the guy that wrote all the lawyer like thrillers? Oh, the uh the oh, uh, uh, Ace Attorney, those ones? No, 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 no not a game. It was novels oh john grisham yeah grisham like you can do a grisham in in a game world right like it's you can't yeah it would end up playing it's a lot pretty, like heavy rain right? or something like that exactly which is super niche anyway point is all of that is to say there's there seems to be just some again dna in the the medium itself of video games that takes pretty well to uh violence I want to talk about it's a good place to delineate a little bit between what we're talking about because we will get into violence is a is a pretty term and actually even more specifically I think so violence is pretty much everywhere uh, <laughs> to some degree or another in games um, you know we were talking about like or like is the Sims a violent game right well your Sims can die in all kinds of horrible ways you can certainly play it violently um, but I you know wouldn't wouldn't categorize that as a as a as a game that is based around violence same thing with you know like minecraft or uh even stardew valley technically has violence in it mm -hmm. um those are very often or like purple space program like those are very often cited as non-violent games or and, you know roller coaster tycoon how many people made that shuttle loop just one car one rail too short and the the people launched okay. off the shuttle loop and went to their death <laughs> or any yeah, in the dinosaur like the jurassic park tycoon um, you just let the dinosaurs out. Like, that's all you do. Anyway, point is, there's violence in those games. I would not call those violent. Well, they're not tend to be thought of for the purpose of this podcast. They, they're not combat based games. Right. Um, seems to be really the, the important delineator here. With violence being, um, let's see here. What did we put for violence? Violence, literally any behavior, force intended to hurt, damage, or kill, um, or any un unpleasant or destructive emotion. Um, or strength uh, would be violence. So it's, that that's pretty much everywhere. Combat um, was pretty simply defined. The dictionary definitions, in large part, that that actually worked pretty well. Combat was defined as just uh, fighting in between armed parties. So mm -hmm. it, it does imply multiple um, willing, well, maybe not willing, but at least multiple parties um, that are in conflict actively and are fighting. Um, it's not a. It's we're not talking like you know, no Russian from. Uh, where you just murder people. That's not combat. And fortunately, you don't see a whole lot of that. We talked about that a little bit in the, the violence episode mm -hmm. we did a few months back. But uh, in any case, combat seems to be the best kind of catch-all for that, that. That would include Spyro, where you have 
you know, these enemies that stand still and shoot little beams at you and then you into them and they appear. Um, that includes Mario, where the Goombas are trying to run at you and hit you and you jump on their heads. That includes Call of Duty, where you shoot someone in the face. That includes God of Gore, you know, like... Mm-hmm. Uh, so combat, I think, is the, the term we're going to go with for uh, for this podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a much more general sort of uh, violence. Again, there's sort of the... There's intent read into right. violence. Like, your intention is to damage or kill or hurt. Um, whereas right. combat is a little bit more... I guess I'll say objective. Like, you aren't reading intent into just combat. Right. It's just, well, there are two people and they're fighting. Like, maybe it's for a tribal ritual. Maybe it's for fun. Maybe it's, right. you know, for a sport or something. Like, you could think of football as a sort of combat. Um, yeah. yeah. As well as, like, and by that definition, right, The Sims doesn't really have combat. I don't know. Can you actually make your Sims fight? I don't know if I've ever I don't, seen that. I don't think so. I don't. Anyway, point is, there's no combat in The Sims even though there is violence. Um, very light combat in Minecraft, you know, so on and so forth. So, right. um, so, so yeah, that's that seems to be an important part of it. Um, this gets into... You want to talk a little bit about, um, like... We, as we were talking about, okay, roles of violence in games um, and why this combat seems to be there. Um, you had an interesting thought. You, you linked back to a uh, rather hot current thinker right now one Jordan Peterson um, and uh, some of his ideas. Yeah, I was just listening to a discussion he was having about play on on his podcast Um, and the idea of play being sort of this um, development of uh, rules in a game that even if, you know, even if people are roughhousing and they're being physical with one another, there's rules established so that the game doesn't get out of hand so that people Mm want to keep playing the game. And so mm-hmm. I think this is a, there can be a sort of limited warfare almost about yeah. uh, wrestling and roughhousing and playing with your siblings or with your parents um, in mm-hmm. a physical way because you, mm-hmm. you, you want the game to keep going. You don't actually want to make the other person uh, damaged or hurt or killed because then the game right. stops. So it's actually right. the opposite of what you want. And so it's, it's play is set up very dichotomously with violence. Whereas violence, right. the goal is to stop the game. Because, I don't know, unless you're sadistic, that really is... You only resort yeah. to violence yeah. when you need to stop something and there's no other way to do it. Play, right. on the yeah. other hand, you actually don't want it to stop. You want it to continue because it's fun. Correct. And it's and play defined you know, ex- exactly in that way is something literally just for enjoyment um, as opposed to any serious or practical purpose. Um, so it doesn't exist for itself, right? Like, you, you can't... If, if you're rough... Like, I have a brother who's five years older than me, also named Mark, so that's confusing. But um, it's not this Mark, uh, my actual brother Mark. But we, we would rough up the time, and he would, you know, he, would, he was f- always five years more developed than me, so I'd lose every single time, and I loved it. And he was, you know, gentle with me. But he would just, like, throw me around and, and all that jazz, and I'd come back. And uh, but so the point of when I was when I was attacking Mark was not to actually destroy my brother, right? Like, I was not actually attempting to make him stop moving so that I could have dominion of the, of the like, living room. Um, <laughs> it was to... It was it was for the sake... Like, it, it actually did not fill any purpose, right? It was, it was for the very sake of getting to interact with my brother and all kinds of other stuff. We can talk about, you know, play and the purpose in, in human development, but... Uh, but in large part, it was it was it was not to actually try to take him out, right? Um, so that is the the difference there. Now, play does have a practical purpose, um, and think think like animals, right? Um, particularly mammals um, and predators. Uh, play is used to teach hunting behaviors, and it, it will winnow through um, the stronger and the weaker uh, members of broods and litters, and uh, and so on and so forth. So there there's, and obviously we don't have to deal with that as much today as humans. Um, Fortunately, Win- but uh, <laughs> um, well, I just, this is the idea of winnowing the brood when it applies to humans. Yeah. It's just it was hilarious. Very, it was those rather yeah insectoid. <laughs> <laughs> I just picture bad. like a daycare where kids are just like going <laughs> like throwing things, and it's like an all-out brawl. And you show up and you ask the daycare worker what they're doing, and they, she just replies, "We're winnowing the brood." I was the brood today. <laughs> it, 
alien I've ever sounded. <laughs> Most of them, like, <laughs> if the humans want to evolve, they must the brood. <laughs> anyway, um, I remember what I was. Oh yeah, okay. Point for play. So play does not not for brood winnowing um, and humans, um, but it is for. And, and this goes into you know like some level of. Um, and this is slightly dangerous ground, um, but hopefully, if, uh, if our listeners know us at all, we uh, have zero political agenda here, <laughs> slash, are yeah. open to everyone um, of all types. Anyway, point is, all these claims aside, uh, the, the gendered issue comes in here too. Interestingly enough, when you talk about play, um, particularly just between girls and girls and boys, and and Mark, again, just like this is not saying how girls and boys should act, but more just a description of how they do historically for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but uh, in general, boys are far more physical and uh, they roughhouse and girls are far more nurturing. Um, and they uh, do not take to the fiscality they, of play that way. They play house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and even I, I have an older sister as well. And uh, I played the most games of the three of my siblings, and uh, and then The Sims came out, and suddenly I was having to fight with my sister over the computer uh, to play Warcraft while she was playing The Sims, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was the only time she ever took some games. And again, that's um, individuals are not populations, populations are not individuals, all that jazz. Um, but I I am pretty sure there's a decent number of of guys my age who had similar stories um, with uh, with a sudden female family member. Um, taking Sims very easily because that is the a, a a really advanced, brilliant way to play house, right? Mm -hmm. um, really cool way to to, um, to nurture, to um, order things, to care for things, to organize things, to mm -hmm. uh, play creativity and power, and um, in a in a very motherly and uh, and that is. Again, generalizing, but certainly that men <laughs> didn't make quite as if, if if we're playing this like kind of play card between there's a level of of I mean is playing video games right? It's a leisure thing right. that um, it's replacing normal play um, in a digital age for boys. Then it makes a lot of sense that the physicality of combat would be something that would resonate a lot stronger with with boys and girls. And of course, for the up to current day, um, which is of course changing, it's, which is awesome. Um, but uh, males have by far dominated the industry, both as consumers as, and certainly as developers. So in some ways, again, if we go back to this kind of like the purpose of, of, of play, um, it actually makes sense that combat would be there in something that was designed specifically for play for males. Yeah. Right? It's uh, a huge jump. And that's one of the reasons why, in, in case you're wondering why we're having this discussion about play, I think there's a lot of people who look at video games and just see violence. And I think that you you could totally reframe the discussion by instead looking at play. And and I agree that it's hard to look at a game like GTA and say like, oh, they're just playing. Like right. he's look, he's torturing that man. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> like I agree. Like not everything that happens in video games really should be couched as play. But I think a yeah. lot of it, like when you start talking about Mario jumping on the head of a Goomba. Like, what happens to that Goomba? Well, I think the most clear explanation is that the Goomba's dead. Um, right. But that doesn't yeah. <laughs> necessarily have to mean that it's not being done playfully. Like, there's already this dimension in... We, we already see that play can resemble violence. And a lot of the difference is the intent. And yeah. is Mario is Mario's goal to cause harm and to damage or kill the Goomba... I don't know. I actually would. I think you can make an argument that Mario's goal is to get to the end of the level, and he's doing yeah. what it has to take in order to to do that. But the kid isn't mostly focused on, yeah, we're gonna take this Goomba out. He's gonna die. Right. Exactly. I don't know any through the level killing everything and then stopped. Yeah. Like, exactly. Trying to meet place in Mario. I guess I'm done. Like no, I. I it's... <laughs> <laughs> Mario, I, I am king way. over this level. I've killed all the enemies. <laughs> Let me just bask in my glory. <laughs> right. It's not really the way that the game is set up. And so right. there's a, and, and yet I do think that it's a, it's a very physical embodied metaphor. Like you were talking about Greg, um, yeah. where, 
Which makes sense, right? I mean, having having a conversation with every Goomba you come across, you know, that would be like a fun novelty, but only because it departure departs from the standard script of like, okay, when you encounter an enemy, you like you get it out of the way, you, you whatever that exactly. looks like. And that's like I don't know, I this again, like that that is not an inherently bad thing at all. By the way, it's like not a that's not a. Uh, I think we live in, particularly in America in, in a culture that is very. Um, very adverse to any conflict of any kind in a lot of ways, certainly in a personally and in and, and child rearing, uh, mostly I'm thinking of. Um, but, uh, but yeah, an obstacle and then have to remove it um, for the good of fin- you know, completing a goal is not that is that is actually very normal, good problem solving for, for kids to be able to learn how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and similarly, that kind of goes back to, right, like the, the me and my brother roughhousing, my brother and I, rather, um, my goal wasn't to actually incapacitate him or to damage him. Um, it was a level of, of, of domination, being able to, like... <laughs> okay, maybe that's a strong word. Being able to, like, overcome an obstacle, right? Being able to struggle against something. Right. Um, and and that is really that between, like, the play and, and the, the more true kind of violence. Um, and that line, I think, video games push, really... They, they try to get as close... I. It would make sense to me if that line was toyed with a lot um, mm-hmm. and pushed as far as possible in video games, um, both because they're an entertainment. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a business, it's an entertainment thing, um, but also because the closer something is, this goes into you know, fantasy and some of the other reasons that games exist, the closer something is to reality or or, or the thing is trying to embody in terms of like the, the type of play it is, um, the more powerful that's going to be, right? Like in 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 Shadow of uh, um, Shadow of War, um, Middle Earth, like you when you take over a fortress as Talion after having murdered your way through all these orcs and, and probably had a pretty spectacular final fight and and gruesome execution of the the previous warlord and you stand at the top of this like fortress and there's this cutscene your whole army's roaring and you plant the banner and and it, the whole territory turns your color like that is a very powerful image it's a very very strong that is that is playing into that like success overcoming obstacles dynamic to an extreme right mm-hmm. some might say far too much in terms of the level of slaughter that you have to enact upon the uh the, the your opponents but at right. the same time it is you know so that that's i don't know that's that line there right and that that gets softened by the fact that it's a fantasy universe and so on and so forth um because you're not actually killing people you're killing orcs and, and all that jazz well, um, one of the interesting things that I mentioned before about, like, in play, people, everybody has to be having fun or the game doesn't continue. Um, mm-hmm. Becomes very interesting. So play is sort of it, couched that way and in the way that I'm describing it is very relational. It's when you're playing with another person. Right. Um, but what if the other person, the thing that you're playing with, is actually a machine that just, it doesn't actually matter if it's having fun or not. And this right. is, I think, kind of a strike against video games and play because Mm -hmm. uh the kids don't actually have to learn what makes a video game keep going like it's just it's always going to keep going it's a it's a device it doesn't matter if it's having fun it doesn't matter if the orcs are okay with you being completely overpowered and you can kill them all in one shot um the game will keep going no matter what you do and so there are some lessons i that i think just don't get learned from kids playing video games um and like or at least playing them by themselves. Now there are cooperative games, and and I think I had this experience actually quite a bit with my siblings, where if they weren't having fun, they weren't going to keep playing. And so, there were certain things that I had to either give up or intentionally lose at, or or do, really? so that they would keep playing with me because I wanted to play with them. And and you did what? I, some games I happen to be better at them then. And yes, so I, and that's... and yet I didn't want them to just walk away and say, okay, this is not fun. Well, that's a great point too. I mean, yeah, no, dude. I, I remember the same thing. There were certain games, uh, Marky, if you're listening, I'm so sorry, but I, I could I could always beat him at Power Stone on the Dreamcast, and uh, and so I would I would throw matches or make him closer or or give myself little kind of secret um, handicaps I wouldn't tell him about to keep him playing with me because it was always more fun playing with Mark than it was I guess the computer. Um, but at the same time, so yeah, no, totally, like, learning that. So the other wrinkle there would be, of course, like, the online aspect of it, too. You were talking about in, in face-to-face play, to c- keep the game going, you do need to keep everyone happy to an extent. Right. Now, 
Uh, like you said, certainly with single player game, you don't have to keep the game happy. But even with the advent of online, you, you suddenly you do not have. Um, I mean, there's there's levels of, but certainly in terms of online play, um, you do not have to keep it. the other player's happiness matters actually almost zero. You will always have other people to play with, right? Right. As everyone off in Overwatch lobby, you click leave and then rejoin another game, and suddenly you have a complete lobby of brand new people to play with. So, keeping the game going is not a kit of kind of that that replacement of of traditional play in video games, mm-hmm. particularly online games. It's the anonymity and the the lack of empathy now one more step would be if you were playing with friends on online games then that still sticks right that that idea of having to be happy to an extent and keep on playing and and being able to foster teamwork and empathy and understanding i think and i think that's brilliant i think it's great i mean a moba team those guys i mean those the amount of social acumen you need the amount of coordination even at small levels like is insane and it definitely teaches good skills well, um, so it's really, I, it's, it goes both ways, I think. It No, it absolutely does. And I think that relational core is really important, though. Like, and if you know the people, if they're your friends, then you care about whether or not they're having a good time because, you know, you want to be able to play with your friends. And yeah. and while it's true that, like, the game Overwatch or League will not stop because certain players make it not fun for other people, um, I would say that broadly, over a long enough period of time, the game will stop. Like, people yeah. will stop playing yeah. a game if it's the community is toxic or the matches are always unbalanced and they never win um, or they're unbalanced and they're never a challenge. Like, all of these things can lead to the death of a game. And so mm-hmm. I, I think that, uh, l- like... In the immediate, it's true that you don't get the feedback of like, oh, I'm having, I'm playing Overwatch with my friend. He's getting ticked off because I just keep like, you know, killing him really quickly, and now he won't play with me. But you don't yeah. have that in online matches, so that feedback is not as instantaneous. But I, I do yeah. think that there's still an outworking of that more broadly that can happen. I know yeah, lots yeah. of people who left uh, League because the community was toxic and they just didn't want to deal with it anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely, and. That that there's more inertia on that big macro scale too. It's harder, right? You need a, a very very large people to leave for league's actual existence to be threatened, where you can no longer play league if this, you know, if and then, um, which never quite got to. But you're right in terms of the the overall scale of of trends and people going and leaving. I mean, yeah, that was a hugely notorious thing for league. Um, yeah, uh, and certainly a game lives and dies off its reputation because at the end of the day, too, right? Like it's it is the experience of sitting down. I played League for an hour. At the end of it, I feel worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very likely to not do that again, right? Or not as much. Um, Well, and the the killer thing is that, like, the, the level of feedback is just not there. Like, for the, for the individual. Like, it's one thing to say, um, you know, you, you ticked off this person and, and, and now they are, you know, not unhappy. But right. to actually start to realize that their happiness is tied to your happiness is really where the yeah. the lesson of play is learned. That yeah. it's not just that I made them unhappy, it's that now I don't get to play because they're unhappy and I need them to play. Right. Yeah, and, and that's not a lesson you learn because you're like, I don't need them. There's millions of people playing this game and I don't care if they leave. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I want to go back to... Um, Again, just kind of the prevalent of you know games as a metaphor for play, and certainly that that male dynamic then might run into the the violence and the combat being a very very uh, important normal thing um, in video games. Um, but I wanted to look at another version. We were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier. Again, just looking at the question from different angles of of the prevalence of of combat and and, and violence. Um, Going back to the idea of like certainly narrative games, which Mark you had read off uh, earlier when we were when we were doing prep, we were looking at just like the the Wikipedia articles of genres of games, uh-huh. and they were like, all like half of them had the word action or adventure in them, um, and almost all of them inherently had some sort of violence in them. Right. Um, and I think certainly with with you know again technology moving forward and games is getting more and more funding and more and more talent and, and the narrative's getting better and better. Um, there is just a level of most stories, like I said, have to have some sort of conflict and opposition, right? Mm-hmm. We already talked about the fact that it's a visual interactive medium. That means combat's an easy way to depict uh, conflict. But past that, even in, in general in games, outside of like pretty much strategy games, um, you are controlling a single entity, 
or the equivalent of a single person, right? Be that a first-person shooter, any first-person action game. Um, even if you are switching between characters in the game, usually you're only controlling one at a time. Right? Sure, yeah. Um, and it turns out there's actually, again, in making a single human humanoid or even single kind of character of, of some type interact with the world um, is very, the simplest way to do that is, again, like physically via violence, um, even within those, those confines. Hmm. And... I agree that so I agree that the simplest way to do to like do that interaction would be physical. I'm not I'm not as sure that it has to be violent. And I right. think that it feels like violence is like a clear way to accomplish a lot of narrative tasks and things physically because it's used so commonly. Um, but right. I think there are other things you could do that are just as physical that aren't wouldn't actually be violent. Well, I was just about to say so so then past that would be like 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 I, I was I was in the all-time favorite, you know, series of anything, which is Lord of the Rings, or just Tolkien's uh, mythology as a whole. And um, in large part, there's very, very, actually little, certainly in terms of the number of words written about combat in uh, Lord of the Rings is extremely low. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, if you've only seen the movies, then there's a lot less description in the books than the combat you see. Um, and the the mass majority of that of the book, and of course everyone would call that an adventure um, in, in its purest form in a lot of ways, um, and a lot of it is, in fact, travel, it's finding new places, it is um, the relationships between the characters. Um, it's a great sense of wonder that Tolkien can invoke very, very, very easily, in my opinion. Um, and uh, that works, and, and hence, so talking about, you know, another famous piece of media that, that did not require, apparently, a whole lot of violence in it. It did have violence and conflict, but um, not nearly as much, certainly percentage-wise, as, as any video game I can think of off the top of my head. Um, it really re had to rely on a sense of, I think, adventure and exploration and wonder. And uh, that's that's just really hard to do in a game, basically. Again, like, to, to give a sense of progress, that's the other thing the games need. You need, like, a beginning and an end of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to progress through wonder. Um, that's why games that do that really well, like Journey, uh, is, like, an hour and a half. Maybe two. Yeah. Um, yeah. You they do that. And, and that's why Journey is so good is that they didn't if you if you were to have expanded Journey times like five times it would not have been a good game honestly um, it would have it would lacking experience and, and we've talked about we, this uh, with with yeah. No Man's Sky right is that ex exploration is fantastic and and it's fun but it's also it, it's sort of like a use sparingly you know it's yeah. like the um, uh, like garlic of, of video gaming you know it's like you want to you want to have the garlic in there like i love garlic but if it's if you've ever had a dish that has too much garlic in it it's like you just don't want to eat it anymore and it almost is like you've got to have something to balance out like the exploring is like the novelty you know novelty is great but you've got to have yep. sort of your home base the thing that you like doing the the satisfying god of war combat where it's like it doesn't matter if i'm fighting this piddly little you know grunt or if i'm fighting a hydra it still feels good and it's fun yeah totally and and so yeah that goes in, and it, i mean even even original reviews and whatnot of people um talking about no man's sky uh people are very excited at first uh even and they maintain that actually the game is good for the first like two hours <laughs> maybe like two to five hours um, right, which is, I think, why the trailer was like, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. It's like, yeah, because you watched five minutes of it, maybe. Yeah, this is almost the ideal version of this game. <laughs> right. Out of actual content. But in any case, so, so I don't know, so let, here, let's let's talk about then, you were talking about physicality that doesn't have to be violent. Let's talk about, like, the non-violent games then that are super successful, or the non-combat based ones. Um, yeah, let's do it. There's not too many. Uh off the top of my head, like I said, even again, I'm I'm gonna give like, like Stardew Valley. I'm not gonna call a combat based game, right? It's just not. It has combat in it. Technically, that's not the reason you play that game, right? Um, same thing with Sims, all that jazz. Uh, like city planners, right? Or or any of the. But yeah, I mean that's basically it. Like the the, the planners, um, the big like macro kind of like strategy games. Um, simulators, basically. I mean, that's the... That's what I was going to say. It's like, you know, Goat Simulator. Not a lot of combat in there. Um, 
<laughs> you know, uh, uh, sports games, I would say, yeah. uh, like um, Rocket League, you know, no combat yeah. in there, or like any of the, the FIFA games. Um, but it's funny because that's actually, I think most people who are you know, anthropologists would say sport came out of tribal combat. So it's oh. it's funny that it it's not about combat, but it's not about combat because they've it was already born out of something else that already abstracted the combat into something exactly. else. And something so else <laughs> it's it's a simulation of another abstraction layered on top of combat. <laughs> so like oh. it's it's kind of weird to call it like not like combat armor? because it it sort of is anyway. <laughs> you heard it here. Sports games are the most important to society. <laughs> the most layered, dynamic, beautifully complex, wonderfully simple. No, I hate sports games. Um, <laughs> and I love sports, so that's... Well, and, like, let's yeah. look at a dom... Like, so a game right now that's super hot. It's not super hot, although super hot is a good game and is a violent game. But a game hey. that is super hot <laughs> is Fortnite, right? And that, I would say, is a game that really plays with this line between violence sure. and play like yeah and, and i sure. would say overwatch also yeah. does this like PUBG, yeah. it's it's more on the violent side i would say just because it's more realistic but fortnite yeah. is like you've got this cartoony look there's no blood there's just sort of people they get zapped out of the arena right they just kind of get their little pod that comes down and they take you out of the area and right. so yeah. no it's screaming Exactly, and so it, it's it's a little playful in that way, and so it really is right pushing that boundary between we've got guns, we've got weapons, but we aren't. Are we doing damage? Uh, mm-hmm. No, I mean, probably. Obviously, everybody's digital, so you're not actually damaging anybody. But right. it's 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 not really about think about how much you're hurting this person. It's really more just like you know, get everybody else out of the arena so you can win. Yeah, totally. As well as. I do want to, for just posterity's sake at least, or just, you know, just the, the fact that this is important, one of the very common arguments made um, against kind of what we're talking about is video games as play, and then th- there is an argument, I think, and it's cer- or at least certainly a discussion, um, of normalizing particularly things in real life that are actually dangerous, right? Like, mm-hmm. I didn't play with my brother with a hatchet, you know? Like, we, we weren't able to use actual knives during play fighting. Right. Um, because that would actually hurt each other. Hence... Like, we had to use, like, toy versions, but we understood that... Anyway, the point is, the guns in Fortnite um, are real in the real world, and they do actually kill people, right? And that's right. a super, super bad thing, and a, and a very big problem in our country. Um, right, right and... and so, that's a, there's a level of, like, yes, there is... That, that's a whole other conversation at top of it, but I at least wanted to, to mention that, like, yeah, despite the fact that it is all, you know, certainly kind of um, play playerized, I don't know, the, the, brought into a, a play-like world. Um, when you do use stuff like that, um, particularly that, that that in the real world is not used for play, um, that can be potentially dangerous. Right, and and for a more thorough discussion on that topic, you can see our Violence in Video Games episode, um, where we talked about desensitization and things like that. Um, yeah. But Connections being- I think... I think that another another topic uh, along these lines I really want to delve into is how does this affect the games that get made and the games that don't get made? Like when sure. we're when we're so uh, focused on this sort of we've we've come up with a lot of good reasons in the last forty five minutes of why why, why violence is- why physical altercations are sort of a way to do games and problem solving in games. But I think there's actually a lot of other ways to interact with objects to. Um, either get them on your side so that they're not a problem anymore to just subdue them or incapacitate them. Like, here's an example. You encounter somebody and you sing them to sleep and then they're no longer in your way. Like, okay, yeah, that that sounds weird. What's that? You know, just describing adventure games all the time. Yeah. You have to have weird, bizarre, you have obstacles, you can't fight them or destroy them. So you have all these bizarre, put the rope in the locket in in the bathtub <laughs> right, you know, that sounds just ludicrous. But you're right; that is the that is the the natural uh, conclusion of a non-combat based way to remove obstacles in a game. Is is it weird? It's weird. It it sounds weird to talk about. It is, and in fact, I think it plays weird because it's very creative and it's very um, 
it's not obvious, right? It's usually, it's more obvious to the people who make it than to the people who are encountering it. And they're like, what? The solution was to like fill the room with water and then freeze the floor so I could skate across it. Like what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. No, seriously, that, that's the thing. Or even, you know, like, I mean, the other side of it would just be puzzle games, right? I mean, in general, like, uh, that's another way to do visual interpretation without uh, without combat. I mean, the I, Talos Principle being a great example of that, where literally you just walk up to consoles with puzzles on them and complete them. Um, well, um, that would be The Witness, actually, but yes. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, Talos Principle is, yeah, that was good stuff. Um, but no, I think, so I think that that's actually a really good point that one of the reasons we don't see different types of uh, problem solving or more different types of problem solving is that they are just not as common and therefore they're less obvious to players. And when you present players with things that are not obvious and you're not trying to create a puzzle, you just create frustration. Like if the player just thinks like, oh, it's clear that the developer thinks I know what to do here, but I really don't. That's right. not like an intriguing moment as a player. That's frustrating. Yeah, as well as yeah, just basically yeah. If you if you put too many of those types of solutions in your game, then it suddenly just becomes a different genre, right? Like suddenly it just becomes a puzzle game or an adventure game. Like that that like alternate way of problem solving just got reduced down into like two little niches, you know, um, and and created their own little, as opposed to like having. And, and obviously, there's there's layers to this in other areas. You know, like you can you can do all kinds of stuff in Skyrim and and, and kind of more open world sandbox RPGs um, that don't involve combat. But at the end of the day, those are also like pretty straightforward combat. But like the whole idea of EXP, right? Like gaining experience is primarily through killing things. And, mm-hmm. and like, um, and that could be you know that traces back to like D and D in large part. Um, yeah. All the way back, if you want again to hear more on. We did a, a episode on tabletop versus uh, or traditional games versus um, video games, right? Um, but it's all very it's all very narratively connected, right? Like yeah. viol- you know, violence were in stories, obviously, way before they were in video games. Um, yeah. But I I think video games have really taken to it, and that's what I want to continue to unpack here. One of the things mm-hmm. about video game violence is that it's very quick, right? It's mm-hmm. like it's it's got that high stimulation feel to it because. Uh, th- people react quickly in combat and in violence. You know, it's sort of the element of surprise is really important. Um, speed and, and dexterity are incredibly important in combat um, in ways that it's it's hard to actually think of something else you could do to to sort of get somebody out of your way that would have that same high energy feel to it. Like, you know, baking somebody some food so that they're not hungry anymore so that they won't eat you. Is that a way to get past a monster? It, it certainly could be, but it doesn't have that sort of urgency and um, high adrenaline feel to it that combat would. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's that's another level of three. And as a uh, um, a product in terms of things that will keep people coming back, we always the bizarre little thing about game developers needing you to play their game. That being a resource in their minds. And uh, and certainly something far more stimulating um, and and graphic and and exciting, um, even neurologically, will certainly provoke a, a stronger response to come back to than say the uh, inherent pleasure you get from yeah cooking something, mm-hmm. um, but harder to to simulate and and you know put your brain into the, the reward loop, you know. Um, but uh, the other one I wanted to talk about in that was as you're talking about like creative ways to attack uh, a problem um, was a game that we started and didn't finish. Um, but uh, undertale was actually a pretty darn good example of a game like that, where in fact it rewards you very much. So for uh, not killing your enemies, mm-hmm. um, engaging in combat at all, um, rather encountering them and problem solving your way through a almost always very bizarre social uh, experiences. <laughs> Um, yeah, to the point where they they will give up, or you've befriended them, or you've spoken to a deep insecurity that they have, or <laughs> what was it, something. Other? Oh, and you just... um. Oh goodness, I don't know if you if you were there for this. It might be in the day that you got into a car accident, right? Uh, but uh, but there was a time where I played where you were a dog petting a dog, and you did, that just like blew the other dog's mind. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. hilarious. I, I loved it, it, that part of the game. Yeah, no, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. 
I was dying. And, like, yeah. I think that was an example of, like, it was enjoyable, it was creative, and it was non com. It was not combat. And, yeah. but th- you have to realize that, like, it, the w- it's obvious when you look at it that it is not the same sort of enjoyment. Like, it's a different right. kind of engagement and enjoyment. And Very much. Uh, so I, I think I think I, I started this episode thinking like guys there are so many other ways to tell stories and to progress that aren't combat based and I think it just even in the process of thinking through this and doing this episode um, I've come I've come almost over to the other side where I'm like actually combat makes a lot of sense like when you're trying to do problem solving and I think the the real sort of uh, killer app of combat is related to its uh, fast paceness and immediacy it's obvious like i see something it's in my way how do i get rid of it by force like and also thing particularly in terms of games the interactivity that can be mastered it's a, it's a skill that you can repeat over and over again mm-hmm. and get better at in the the system of the game right like you can you can meta some of the things that undertale might be looking for in it's it's the ways that his characters present themselves. You can begin to you know learn and and, and in, in a really fantastic way, um, but it's not quite the same as mastering a very tactile. You know, again, even think about the interactions. Like the execution in Undertale is very low, mm-hmm. um, and Undertale's a, another weird example in that the way you unlock these social interactions is actually through a, a bullet hell mini game, basically. Right. Where you have to sort of waves of of you know dangerous things coming at you as a little dot. So it's super abstract, but at the same time, there is a level of, like, it, it does gauge. You are being, you are under, at some point, you are the most abstract version of this, but you are under attack from something, and you are trying to avoid that something um, and uh, and get through it. So that's well, like a... One of the things about Undertale is that, like, although it's true that violence and force is very obvious globally, um, you can make a game where locally it's obvious that you have alternatives. And I'd say Undertale is an example of that. Like, by the you know fourth or fifth enemy, we started to realize, like, oh, there's always going to be a way to not have to kill this thing. There's always... Mm-hmm. Gonna, and, and it might be really hard. Like, there are enemies that we just had to end up running away from because we hadn't figured out what the nonviolent solution was to dealing with them. But just the idea... That you've put that idea in the player's head of, like, there is another way to do this. And, and I think the way that Undertale worked that in was just masterful. It became obvious very quickly that you didn't have to resort to force. And I would love to see more games do that. I, you know, we talked about Deus Ex on this podcast and how you can have sort of a, a pacifist uh, approach to the game where you are yeah. you are doing more of a stealth sort of approach for the for solving the tasks. And right. I, I think that that is very interesting and kind of an underexplored area of games. Um, there can still be deep mechanics. I do think that they won't be as as fast paced and they won't yep. be as visceral. But I think they can be enjoyable in other ways. And one of the ways Undertale made itself so enjoyable was by being so funny and just creative. Oh, oh, brilliant. Well, I think that's the other thing is that I think the that, that dominant narrative has been violence and combat for so long in games that anything... Like, it's actually hard to... Usually the problem with games that give you nonviolent options is it's just so much easier to do the violent one. Right. Right? It just almost by default will always be easier to just kill the dudes. Um, instead of going through this really intricate stealth portion that is, like, really... Right, Metal Gear Solid is a great example. Xander and I have been playing MGS5, which is brilliant, and uh, and it, I always start the mission wanting to be the super spy that Solid Snake is, and I get caught, and I'll just gun... I'll just kill everyone. I'll call on a support <laughs> helicopter. <laughs> I brought an RPG on a hostage mission once, uh, just because I knew it was going to go shit. And uh, and and that was that, you know. And at the end, stealth is really easy when everyone's dead. Um, <laughs> like you blow up the radar, just like scorched earth this whole village in Afghanistan. That just um, reminds me this, uh, you know, the quote from Pirates of the Caribbean by uh, Barbosa, where he says, "People are easier to search when they're dead." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, actually, everything's easier when everyone else is dead. When everyone, yeah, right? And the point is, so I, I, and I don't think that's a problem of. Um, I think it's just again like MGS is built for combat. Um, it, it that those that that whole system in the DNA of the game is it, not a true stealth game. It honestly has combat and and gunfighting at its core, and uh, and so hence gunfighting is easier. Um, 
Right. And well, think, it, it is such a prevailing <laughs> metaphor. Systems. They can give you the option to not do the violent part, but because it's such a normalized part of the way we think about games, and usually is the easiest option right. in games because it's designed. Uh, that's the the way it normally goes. Well, so I think it, Undertale is a great example of where that is. I think that's a, a pretty rare example where the non-combat version is just as satisfying and, um, if not more so satisfying, than the actual uh, non-violent one. Yeah, I think it's made to be more satisfying. And if you think about how you're armed, quote-unquote, as a, as a person in yeah. Undertale, like, your attacks aren't very interesting. Like, uh, actually attacking somebody is... Yeah. It's way... I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's way less interesting, but it's um there's not flashy like the combat is not satisfying they don't give you a gun right like uh it, violence are is already a really dominant metaphor in video games but you you make it very much like worse when you give them a gun right when you give the player it's like okay yeah. this gun is going to be the solution to all my problems in this game like that's what i'm thinking if i am a, I'm a player in a game and i get a gun i'm like okay if something bad ever happens just start shooting things good exactly I know no, what totally. to do here because I'm a gamer, and and this has been something that's been happening in games for decades. Right, right, over and over and over. No, that's that's a good point. I mean, the second you get a weapon in a game, um, and this goes back into the power dynamic and all that, and and, and maybe some of the not as helpful, healthy things in in video games. Um, but the second you get a weapon, you have the ability to, um, you know, like that's the first thing you do in Dark Souls, right? Is you have to find uh, a sword and a shield, right. and then suddenly you begin to interact with the game. Um, and suddenly you're good or uh, yeah what's the I'm trying to think I think one of the opening to one of the Halo games starts with you without a weapon and once you get your finally you find your assault you're, all right, you're in you're, you're locked in mm-hmm. and you know you know everything's going to be alright well, and that's that's one of the stri- again another strike against games is that this this idea that I can't contribute to the world I can't do anything without a weapon without force um is just it's true in a lot of video games but it's not true in real life and i just think it's one it's not that like you know you can't learn anything from video games or they're bad or whatever obviously i don't think that but i do think there are certain lessons that are either very hard to learn from games or you just will never learn them from games and uh contributing to the world uh without force or violence there's a lot of games that won't teach you that like halo won't teach you that gta won't teach you that yeah not not really um, you want to end here on this little, uh, little discussion of the top the 10 game? The yes. Well, this was fascinating to us. So you want to tell the people what we found? Sure. I was just, I was, I was like, all right. Semblance of, uh, of, of data to back some of this up, um, as we talk about violence and all that jazz. And, um, so I just looked up, uh, top games between 2000, 2009. So that decade. Um, I do recognize that's an arbitrary decade. Um, that was kind of when I was growing up in games, so that was the one I, I first thought of. But um, regardless, it seems to be a decent uh, a decent place to start. Um, it was the last full decade of data we have, at least. Um, there's not actually... A, it, it's hard to get sales data. Um, but uh, here, here's the... Um, this is according to multiple sources. Um, mostly just Wikipedia and then a couple other uh, places that did their own analysis. So... I think there was a few differences between the order, but in large part, the top ten was was always the same. So uh, we have um, number one, Wii Sports. Number two, we play. Number three, Nintendo Dogs. Number four, we fit. Number five, New Super Mario Bros. DS. Number six, Mario Kart Wii. Number seven, Brain Age. Number eight, GTA San Andreas. Number nine, Pokemon Gold Silver. Number ten, Pokemon Diamond Pearl. Yeah, and when I heard that list, I was like, that's incredible and totally goes against what I expected after thinking so much about this topic. Yes, uh, the and there's so I want to be careful about drawing too many conclusions out of such a limited piece of data. Um, that's something that is done very poorly, very often, even game journalism, um, or professional game journalism. And uh, so, yeah, don't read too much into this. This doesn't mean that everything you said is wrong. At the same time, it's a really interesting. It, it, at the very least, it begs the question of um, there is a level for an entire decade, at least. Um, and like pretty, like if you keep on going down the list, it doesn't. It's not like it switches right to violent stuff right after. Actually, even the top like forty games 
um, the 30 of 31 of them are like nonviolent in, in the way we've been talking about, um, are the top sellers. And, you know, as we've often talked about games being a business, it's like, okay, so if you look at this in theory, in a very closed system, right, the market should just be moving towards more and more nonviolent games because <laughs> mm-hmm. they're literally the best. I mean, that's where the money is. That's where all the money went. But then um, we found looking at this last decade, 2010 to present, that trend mm-hmm. did not hold. Nope, sure didn't. Not even uh, a little bit. Like it was, when, it, like arguably the the polar opposite being Call of Duty, where you just play as a person with guns shooting human beings. Right, and Call of Duty, I think, was four or five of the top fifteen games of that of the last eight years, and then uh, you it, know that the number one game was GTA Five, by far, which is you know notorious for you know, again being the game where you can burn hookers alive without right. consequence. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that was an interesting little, and obviously, you know, we've talked about, or I don't know if we talked about, but the Wii had being bundled with sports and play was a big part of it. I think there were even some bundles with Nintendo dogs as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Nintendo absolutely dominated that, uh, that decade, which is interesting in so much as what got me thinking about, we look at these two things. One, I wonder this data would be impossible to have, but we only have sales. Um, number of hours played, like if you could somehow total the number of hours played of a single game um, across everyone who played it, what that list would look like, right? Because um, a high high level of, of of all the people that got Wii Sports, uh, you know, the family that bought a Wii just because it was it was cool and fun and Japanese. Um, <laughs> this is exceedingly Japanese. Um, <laughs> and then played it for like two hours and then didn't touch it again, right? Um, right. Versus, you know, a gamer that bought San Andreas probably would put a crap ton of hours into that. Right. Um, but so again, if, I, if I'm if i selling games, I don't really care which one it is, yeah. right? I no. mean, we've talked about this before. But from a marketing standpoint, it does seem like there's more of a market for nonviolent games than if you look at, like, for example, the top 20 games on Twitch right now would lead you to believe. I mean, unless you're a card game, you're pretty much going to be a violent game up there or, you know, a sports game. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and then, but, but then, so that made me think again, like, you know, I, I consider Mark and myself to be quite, uh, members of gaming, you know, like the gaming culture slash, you know, keep up with news and, and all that jazz. Um, that, that is just kind of, I think particularly even with like gaming websites and, and, or, or even Reddit as a whole, you know, our gaming and, um, or any level of game journalism is a very, very tiny little echo chamber and the full it was just it was a good wake up call for me i think to see that like oh no like they're of the games no one talks about those games on any of these sites right like they they talk about them as fads um no one talks about them as like the best games of all time or i mean with the exception of gta honestly <laughs> and a couple of the couple of the pokemon games um mm-hmm. but uh but that is that is what sold so the 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 number of people the, the people that are playing games are different than than us, right? We're not. It, it's important for us as <laughs> people that think and, and talk a lot about games to recognize that that they exist for other people too, right? Um, and we're that, yeah, you know, we are there. We are tend to talk about games for which there is a lot to discuss and a lot of things to analyze or new uh, new techniques being tried. And uh, I, I think that's probably does apply to like we sports and we play, um, but for some reason it's just it's not the cool thing to talk about. I was gonna say, how are we gonna? Do you want us to do an episode on like, Dead Dogs? I mean, I'm sure we I, could. I think that would be a really fascinating episode. Actually, I, I don't know yeah. if our viewers would that share really share me in that in that idea. But yeah. uh, that example. All right, we fit. You want to we fit it? Uh, that would be a good one too. Dang it, Renee, that'd be interesting. All right, the Mario Kart Wii. I have no. I played it a lot. It's fine. Yeah, there's not nothing really groundbreaking about it. it. Anyway, point is, all that's to say, um, that was a, a very interesting. Like I said, no, no huge, um, but it was really interesting in terms of uh, the numbers there. It's, like I said, seems to suggest a extreme. So then, talking about like why after 2010, maybe it was just this weird little thing with the Wii, and Nintendo just hit a hit an absolute gold mine with it, and, and we see a big, huge jump in the, the non-violent games for that decade because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I don't know. I, I, I mean, if you guys have thoughts, please let us know. Uh, 
why you think that might have been the case, um, particularly in the face of, like we said, years of kind of gaming culture and tradition um, going against that. Or yeah. what, uh, and I, what and I mean. don't think it invalidates like what the stuff that we've said, like the reality is most genres of games are have violence inherent to the genre. Like yeah. just even just the ideas that people have tried in gaming have been uh, they've they've had combat they've had violence but uh, yeah. but there also are specific niche games like Wii Sports and Nintendo and I think we would call those niche because they don't fall into a a uh, very popular genre um, they have yet nevertheless if they've sold a lot and so we have yeah. these exceptional games that that kind of go against the prevailing trend of having combat in your games um, and yet they've become successful and so. Uh, although it doesn't go against the, the what we've been talking about on the podcast, it is food for thought of why are these why are these topics not being explored more thoroughly if they are so uh, successful? Yeah, seriously. As well as I mean, even from like a marketing standpoint, that's all Nintendo. Why didn't Soft and Sony take note of the just staggering sales that these titles had and tried to even do like I don't know if they did. Um, I, I can't think of any. I mean, obviously they both tried to get into like the Connect and the. Um, the PlayStation Move, I think, was the the version of their motion controller. But um, in terms of the titles, like I, I, as far as I know, all of those like Sports Play, Fit, Nintendo Dogs, Rain Age, um, those are all Nintendo exclusives, right? I don't know yeah. if Brain Age is. I don't know if Brain Age is. I know Brain. I know Big Brain Academy is, but purely business standpoint, it's like, dude, there was a market for that crap, and even if they weren't good. And it wasn't like a the point or, or who you were trying to market to. You know, Nintendo's definitely marketing to family. Sony and Microsoft tend to market to like the hardcore gamers or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of money on the table there for a decade. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, we've got to wrap up here. Um, if you have some thoughts on your own about this particular trend that we're talking about or anything we've talked about regarding play and violence in video games, you can hit us up mark at gamingmechanics.net or greg at gamingmechanics.net if you want to give a couple of dollars to help greg get a playstation 4 um, uh, yeah. that would be amazing literally with our viewership if everybody gave two dollars we'd be set we'd be good um and so go ahead and <laughs> check us out patreon.com slash gaming mechanics um, unbelievably appreciated definitely not uh, uh expected we will keep but, doing this podcast even if you don't give anything yeah so. that is very true <laughs> all right <laughs> Uh, cool. cool peace guys bye bye if you enjoyed this episode of gaming mechanics check out our twitter at gaming mechanics or our facebook by going to facebook.com slash gaming mechanics thanks for listening